Welcome and thank you all very much for coming to this very special evening at Roosevelt House. It is my great honor to be here with my very old friend Barney Frank who was really one of the first vital heroes of the LGBTQ movement when he was in Congress and what excited us the most when he was in the Congress and out of the closet was that he was regularly voted the smartest congressman in Washington by the congressional staff. For nearly two decades, he was the most prominent gay member of the United States Congress, first elected to represent the 4th Congressional District of Massachusetts in 1980. He came out in 1987, and in 2012, he became the first member of Congress to marry someone of his own sex, and Nancy Pelosi was among the many celebrants at that wedding. As chairman of the Financial Services Committee, Barney was one of the two principal authors of the Dodd-Frank Act which brought about the most sweeping reform of the financial services industry in modern times. We have a stellar student panel who are going to ask gentle questions of the congressman after he's spoken. Andrew Shikali is a Thomas Hunter Honors Junior studying English literature, human rights, and public policy. He's a co-president of Hunter's Queer Student Union. His goal is to attend law school and engage in the policy process through meaningful impact litigation. Kat Watson is a genderqueer writer and artist focused on ideas surrounding identity, love, and collaboration. As a member of the Queer Student Union at Hunter College, she has helped lead discussions focused on transgender experiences and issues, and currently is a senior studying creative writing. Jackie Fennell is an LGBT student at Hunter College. As someone who is active at Hunter Hillel, she advocates to make the space more inclusive to LGBT students. She is majoring in political science and minor, minoring in geography and hopes to become a mental health counselor for geriatric patients. And finally, Sergio Mota is a senior studying in political science. I think he's the only other person on the panel who's already won for, run for a public office once. He's an Eva Cast and Grove fellow at Roosevelt House working with a mentor on the policy issues involving un for underrepresented communities in the census. Currently, Sergio works at a local law firm. He also serves on the board of directors for a nonprofit media company, Vero Communique. And my name is Charles Kaiser, and I'm the acting director of the LGBTQ Center, and I'm very glad to see all of you. And without further ado, my good friend, Barney Frank. Thank you, Charles. Is this is on? I guess it is. Charles is a good friend, and I was happy to uh, come and talk. This is really an extraordinary time. Um, I uh, will give a brief <clears throat> history. It's actually I'll, I'll take it from my memoir um, because my personal history and the movement for equality for people, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, kind of coincide. Um, in the mid-50s, I was a teenager, I decided I would like to get into politics, but I knew that that wouldn't work because I knew I was gay, and to be gay in 1953 was uh, toxic, and uh, I knew that to be successful in politics, you had to be popular and respected, and there was nothing, no status more disrespected than uh, being gay or lesbian back in 1953. So I figured I would be at the periphery of politics, made career choices based on that. Uh, I'll do the, uh, the spoiler now. Um, as I got older, and as I matured, America matured even more in many ways, and by the time I, uh, I retired, being gay was much more socially acceptable than being a member of Congress. <laughs> I mean, literally. When they polled in my last year, 2012, my marrying Jim that year actually had a higher rating than the Dodd-Frank Act. I think they've kind of uh, uh, eased out. Um, uh, but despite the fact that it did have a higher rating, it was still considered sort of somewhat extraordinary. It got enormous worldwide attention, and I, I was just interviewed in the Washington Post about the wonderful phenomenon of uh, 
Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and uh, uh, I said, look, one thing is I, I'm just delighted at the positive, in fact, I think he's benefiting from being gay, running for president, and he's clearly, if he was straight, he would not be getting, what happens is his being gay gets him the attention. His being extremely talented then allows him to use the attention favorably. But if he was a straight 37-year-old mayor of a small town, he would uh, be kind of getting ridiculed. He, he's turned that around. And part of that is the loving relationship with his husband, which comes forward. I will tell you, um, uh, at the suggestion of a mutual friend, Charles Andy Tobias, um, my husband and Justin Buttigieg are trading phone calls to kind of talk about what it's, what it's like. Um, but what's happened is that uh, the America, well, let me put it this way. In 1987, I decided uh, to come out. I'd gotten elected to Congress. I got elected to the state legislature, to my surprise, in 72. I was surprised being gay and closeted that it was possible, shows the progress we'd made. And I should add, there is no event in American history, no single event, that has had the social and political impact of Stonewall. There was no other movement where you can say that's when it changed. Because I was involved in politics. I was working for the mayor of Boston uh, before and after. And I can tell you that uh, as late as 1970, because they don't happen absolutely overnight, there was no gay political activity in Boston. Uh, by 1971, there was. I mean, it just it just happened. Um, and I figured that, uh, while people might suspect I was gay, there was one part of downtown Boston, the Back Bay and Beacon Hill, very atypical, not very much like Boston. It was yuppie before we used the word yuppie. And I figured, you know, I could get elected here. I wouldn't be able to get elected to anything else, but I'll do it. So I ran, but I also knew that if I came out, I would not get elected even there. Um, I may have been too pessimistic, but I didn't think it was going to work. Um, and there was a period we had in American politics where if the first thing people knew about you was that you were gay or lesbian, you didn't do very well. But if you had established yourself and subsequently came out, if you were a Democrat, you weren't going to get repudiated. And I say that, and one of the things that is undervalued by a lot of middle class, respectable people is the role that partisanship plays. I didn't choose to make LGBT rights a partisan issue. The Republican Party did. And today, and for the last couple of decades, there is no issue on which the two parties are more separated than on the question of fairness and equality. Um, and it, it's, it's even more pronounced now than it was uh, a, a few years ago. But when I came out, uh, people said, well, you know, you better poll to figure out how are people going to react when you announce you're gay? So I said, OK, I'll have to do that. And a uh, couple interesting things. One, one thing I, uh, struck me personal. They asked uh, if people were uh, uh, happy or not to learn that I was gay. And a pattern there that continued for a long time. It turned out um, men were troubled, women didn't care, which was interesting. Uh, it was also a little bit ego deflating because they have, when you've done a poll, random comments that the pollsters will put in. And apparently not women said, oh, damn, uh, when they found out I was gay, which is, as I said, a little deflating. But. Um, <laughs> The most important sets of questions were these. Did people think I was going to lose votes because I came out? This is uh, early 1987. 44% thought I would lose votes. That's a troubling number. That's not far from what it takes to feed you. But then people were asked by very good pollsters. I'm sure these, these answers were pretty accurate. Are you personally less likely to vote for him? And that was 22%. Twice as many people thought I was going to be hurt as I was, and that turned out to be fairly accurate. And by the way, as to that 22%, they were people who were never going to vote for me anyway uh, at that point because of my gay rights advocacy. So it really meant I would not lose very much, if anything. Um, but it, I, I, it struck me as I thought about that. And I think this explains how we've done and why we are where we are and why I'm optimistic about the future. I, I realized from that Americans are not as homophobic as they thought they were supposed to be. Sadly, more racist than they're willing to admit. 
And that explains why we have made more progress, in fact, in diminishing prejudice against us than has been diminished against African Americans. I mean, in, in every case, the problem of race is worse. There's always, there is one advantage that uh, African Americans have over gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people. Uh, and it's, it's important, but it's far outweighed by all the disadvantages. But it is the case that no 15-year-old or 18-year-old African American has ever worried about telling his parents he was black. That has not been a problem. <laughs> but everything else, it's worse. What happened was uh, I came out and not much changed. And what I realized was, and there was one other factor that helped uh, change things around. AIDS, one of the most terrible things that's ever happened to any population group. Um, but it had one beneficial effect, although it is not a beneficial effect anybody would remotely have, have accepted as a, as a good trade-off. But when I got to Congress in 81, although I was still closeted, I was a gay rights advocate. I filed a gay rights bill in 1972, my first year in Congress. I also filed a legalized marijuana bill, which has immunized me from charges of hypocrisy when I joined a board to a, a retail a wholesale marijuana seller. And I will tell you, having filed those two bills, I'll give you one of my rules for being an ethical politician. Um, no one that I know of obeys every law. We have way too many, and it would be impossible. But I do believe, particularly if you've been a legislator, you are morally obligated to obey every law that you voted for. And I, I believe I can show that I have done that. But the, um, even if it lost, obviously, is a, is a key. But um, I uh, would lobby other members of Congress to vote not pro-gay, but not anti-gay. The, in the 80s, it was still... Like D.C. passed a law abolishing the sodomy statute, and Congress used its power to override that. And when I approached members in the early 80s, I would be told, oh, look, pal, I, I, you're right, though. We shouldn't mistreat those people. They didn't know I was one of them. But they said, but you know what? It's not that big a deal. Nobody really gets hurt by this. And I'm not going to take the political heat for something that's purely symbolic. Well, uh, I realized... They didn't know that it, that it hurt people because we never told them. I mean, this is why coming out was so important in two senses, the process of coming out. One was that people learned who we were and that they had all these people close to them who were uh, that group. But it was also the case that we, we hid our pain. Nobody knew what we were going through. You wouldn't tell them. Um, then came AIDS that forced a lot of people out. And it also forced my colleagues to confront the reality that if they did not vote against anti-gay measures, they were going to kill people. Because there were measures that would have interfered with the research, would have interfered with San Francisco General Hospital and what it did. And I began to get members whom I was lobbying saying, oh, damn, I, I guess I have to vote with you because of this, especially I was out by then. And uh, what happened was, and this again confirmed it, again, this is in support of this basic thesis that the public was not bigoted, but thought it was supposed to be. As members of Congress, for the first time in large numbers, voted against the anti-gay measures, and we defeated most of them, they were all re-elected. Nobody got defeated. It was further confirmation. And as we went forward, that promoted more and more people to come out. Uh, we, we have reached that point. So we are now at a point, I believe, as I said, there's a partisan division. Um, if you are a Republican politician and you come out, you will not survive. You will lose in intra-party measures. But in terms of the general public, uh, we have not just the mayor of South Bend. We have the governor of Oregon, a senator from Arizona, um, the governor of Colorado, mayor of Chicago, mayor of Chicago an African-American, um, and the uh, a number of members of Congress. It is at the point where it is very, I don't think it's much of a political issue. It is still the case that I do not think a lesbian could get elected to Congress in Mississippi. Neither could a sensible white person <laughs> in, in most of Mississippi. I say that because there is one African American. The, the, the African Americans will, will vote for reasonable people in the South. But I think we have made overwhelming political progress. I think we are on the verge 
of this becoming irrelevant. Now, it's geographic. Um, there are still parts of the country where there is a, a license to be prejudiced. Even there, I'm somewhat encouraged that I'd say this, and I'll finish up. Um, we have achieved legal equality in most cases, in most senses. Uh, there is a little bit of a lag on the transgender issue, but um, that issue came to public attention later and has made very quick progress. I think uh, uh, it, 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 Trump's attack on transgender people is unpopular, it's unpopular in Congress. Unfortunately, it stands for a while, but I, I do not think it will, it will be hard to get rid of at some point. And uh, I can see even a split Congress at some point in the future voting uh, to, to uh, say, no, that can't be done. But in most of America, i.e. where most of the population lives, there are no legal obstacles and increasingly not much uh, prejudice. And these are self, this is a virtuous circle. As there is less prejudice, less legal objection, more people are free to be honest about who they are. And as more people are honest about who they are, we win. Uh, one of the things that helps us, and in this case, I mentioned marijuana, so I wanted to get back to it. I think there was a similarity between the legalization of marijuana and same-sex marriage. In both cases, there is something that a lot of people like to do, and some other people wish they would but in America, there's a kind of a libertarian streak. You rarely can get ahead by saying people shouldn't do something because you don't approve of it. That's not considered good. So what happens is people who morally disapprove of things that are really none of their business have to come up with reasons why this, in fact, hurts other people. They have to come up with reasons why it impacts the non-users. And they did it with marijuana, and they did it with same-sex marriage. There was a great billboard somewhere in Manhattan I used to see coming in from the airport that said, if you are opposed to same-sex marry, don't enter one. <laughs> that was the best answer. But the, um, uh, what happens is this, in both cases, again, there's a vicious cycle. Um, people say, respectable people say it'll have negative consequences. So people who don't know say, well, you know, I don't really object, but it could have negative consequences, I'm not gonna do it. People aren't ready to take social experimental risks. So you don't have same-sex marriage. You have marijuana being illegal. And then some jurisdiction somewhere breaks through and allows it. Massachusetts in 2003 on marriage. Colorado and Washington most dramatically on marijuana. And what happens is, it turns out, no, there are no negative consequences. People made all that stuff up. And as it becomes clear that the negative consequences imputed to these behaviors don't really exist, they, they spread. And I, I think if you look at the, the spread of legalization of marijuana, very similar to that of, uh, of same-sex marriage. Now, you won't get a constitutional decision from the Supreme Court, certainly not this Supreme Court, but uh, uh, the, the, the Democratic House is about to pass a number of pro-marijuana bills that legalize marijuana, and I think uh, some of them will actually pass the Senate. But at any rate, where we are now, I think, is the, the fact is that uh, Americans were not as homophobic as they thought they were, and they are much less than they were because of people coming out. And the coming out had two effects. First of all, it helped dispel the myth about who we were and how we acted. Our reality destroyed the, the, the prejudices. But secondly, people learned that they're relatives and their customers and their friends and their doctors and their teammates, et cetera, were also gay. And one of the things I think helped was the fact that so many people were surprised when people close to them came out. Because as I argued, how bad can we be if you couldn't even tell? <laughs> you lived with someone for 32 years and you didn't know? So what does that say about the reality of any negatives? Uh, and so I'm very optimistic. Um, I think we are gonna go forward. There is the problem, the last one, that there will be this religious exemption allowed and the current Supreme Court is unfortunately likely to extend it. Now the real danger would be if they decide aggressively to say that people can avoid recognizing our legal equality even in the absence of a statute that allows it. And that I hope doesn't happen, that's the more dangerous one. Because I don't think the likelihood of a lot of laws being passed 
that give people the right to discriminate is very high. And our ally here is the profit motive. In a number of states where they were going to pass these laws that gave businesses the right to deny us either services or, by extension, employment, they have de been defeated politically with the business community actively against them because business people do not want to be given the freedom to choose between being anti-gay or bigoted, uh, I mean, or, or, or pro. That Businesses would rather say to the bigots, hey, don't blame me, the law says I gotta serve everybody. And so literally, you, you've had active in Texas and other more conservative states. They've defeated these laws. So I am not afraid of these laws being widely passed. There is the possibility that a right-wing Supreme Court will decide that there is this religious right in an aggressive way. Um, that was one of the issues in the background on the bakery case, but um, there was a free expression issue there. I, I am skeptical that Chief Justice Roberts would go that way. He's an institutionalist who is worried about the court. But that's literally the only obstacle I see, and I think uh, increasingly, uh, uh, people who live in the great majority of this, the great majority of the population will live totally free, not just of legal obstacles, but of, uh, of prejudice. Uh, there will still be vulnerable minorities, uh, the uh, violence against transgender people and other people who don't conform uh, in, in some ways uh, we will have to look at, but I don't think that that will be officially pursued. It will be uh, there'll, there'll be a violence. Um, even at a time when we were having difficulty getting people to vote to protect transgender people in employment, and it took us a while to get a majority for that, uh, we were able to pass in that same year uh, inclusion of transgender people in the uh, hate crimes bill. And uh, I just want to add one last thing from the standpoint that I just always think people should know this. Of all the... Uh, groups, ethnic, economic, whatever, in the U.S. House of Representatives, the most consistently supportive of uh, our rights has been the Congressional Black Caucus. The Congressional Black Caucus has, in fact, been even more supportive than the, uh, than the gay members. Not than the openly gay members. You throw in the closet of Republicans, they bring down our average. But um, <laughs> the open members have been fine. But, uh, and they did that, many of them, despite some opposition in, in the uh, more traditional areas of the black ministry, there was a great deal of, there was some opposition. These are people who were biblical literalists, fundamentalists in the church, and they had to stand up to them. In fact, we had a critical meeting in which the Democratic caucus endorsed going ahead with adding full uh, the gender identity and sexual orientation protection to the hate crimes bill. And a couple of the African-American members said, look, tell me, I want to vote for this. How do I explain myself to the preacher who says, I'm interfering with his right to preach against homosexuality in the Bible from Leviticus? And uh, I was then the chairman of the bank committee, and I said, let me explain, because I was the sponsor of the hate crimes bill. The fact is that the hate crimes bill, for anybody, has nothing to do with speech. We couldn't criminalize speech if we wanted to. I hope people still feel that way. The hate crimes bill adds a penalty to people who have committed violence against persons or property motivated by prejudice. And the rationale for that is, if someone attacks one person, that person is in fear. But if someone attacks one person and makes it clear that the basis for that attack is a broader category, everybody in the category is in fear. There's a rational reason to want to deter that. Um, but I said, I do, I do want to explain, nothing in this bill will criminalize any speech or will prevent anybody, clergy or not, from being critical of us. I said, let me summarize it this way. If this became law tomorrow, it would still be entirely legal to call me a fag. I just wouldn't recommend it to people in the banking business. Hi, Congressman. Thank you so much for being here today. 
Um, so uh, my question is, one of my questions is, um, what were some setbacks that the LGBT movement faced in the past that you'd like to see readdressed today? What, I'm sorry, give me a um, What were some setbacks that the LGBT oh. movement faced well, in the past? Well, the, um, the setback, the biggest setback we had, we had a steady, we had a steady march where things were getting better. They weren't getting better fast enough. Um, I will say this. Um, if at any point in the last, well, not if, at any point in the last 40 years, if you would ask me to talk about how much progress we would have made three years earlier, I would have been too pessimistic. I mean, I would not have seen being gay as an advantage for, for Pete Buttigieg. Um, but um, the, 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 the real setback we got, well, first of all, there's always a setback. People talk against, about a backlash. The fact is when people are totally quiescent and passive and accept abuse, it's very peaceful. And when you speak up and start to fight it, then you have opposition that doesn't exist before. But in almost every case, they're not pushing us back, we're making progress. The problem came in 93, and it's sort of an unfair characterization of Bill Clinton. President Clinton in 92 said during his campaign that he would abolish the ban on uh, gays in the military. And nobody paid a lot of attention to it. And then when he got into office, um, here's what happened. He got unfairly criticized for making it too early. A judge in San Francisco in 92, before he took office, ruled that the ban was unconstitutional. In the case of a, uh, a guy, Keith, I forgot his last name, he's in the Navy. And Clinton was then confronted with the fact that a month into his presidency, he was going to have to decide whether to appeal that decision or not. And the problem was that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when that decision was handed down in 92, before Clinton was president and had no influence over him, was Colin Powell, who has done a lot of good in America, but was a terrible factor in this. And he spoke out and not only said that he was against getting rid of the ban, but uh, he said it was not like uh, the ban, the, the segregation. One of our arguments was, you know, Harry Truman integrated and it, it, it was a little tension, but it worked. And Colin Powell specifically denied that. And he used a very unfortunate word. I knew what he meant, but it was just the worst way to say it. He said, after all, race is a benign condition. He meant benign as opposed to active. Uh, although sort of arguing the choice issue, which is pretty bad. But of course, for most people, what's the opposite of benign? Malign. So that, that hurt us. And as a result, and then Sam Nunn, who was a terrible bigot uh, throughout his life and homophobe, was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, a Democrat, and he joined in. And so the result was uh, that we were worse off. That was the one time it took us a while to to get that back. And Clinton, to his credit, did try to change it. But then he lost, and I am critical of him because he did not, he, he, he did not stand up for even the limited compromise he got. But other than that, I can't think of a time when things were uh, set back. And many of the efforts to do that, we've, we've won. When some people tried to uh, refuse to conduct same-sex marriages, they got repudiated, um, including that woman in, was it Kentucky? Uh, a pro-marriage person won that job that she had in an election. Um, that that was the main one. The uh, even AIDS, as I said, was a terrible thing. There was I, I, people were afraid. I was too. That AIDS was going to make it worse for us. In that there were people who said, "Oh my God, we better quarantine these people." I mean, we we're going to be, you know, we we were social lepers. This was going to make us literally lepers. And in a uh, one of the, you know, I'm not always an admirer of uh, what the great majority of the people want to do. But in this case, the American people were great. And uh, the, the, there was a reaching out and, and not a, uh, a refusal. So the, and in fact, as I said, it forced some members of Congress to say, OK, we, we, we got to work with these, this group to sell things. So AIDS was not the setback that we, we thought it would be. Interesting about AIDS. One of the problems we have is that the media had a rule, and still does, that they don't out you unless you want to be outed, uh, except for some fringe people. And um, 
I understand the privacy part of that, but what it meant was, for a very long time, the only people who were outed were people um, who got involved in some scandal. And then only people would, well, age, for the first time, led to respectable people being outed, not in the best circumstances, Rock Hudson and others. Um, so age was not the setback. The military ban uh, it was the only one where I thought we made an effort and wound up worse than we had been before for a while. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Andrew. Um, so I just want to ask what, what you. What did you run for? Hmm? Yeah, that was oh, you ran. Yeah, that's Sergio. I'm Andrew. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to ask quickly. So there's currently a discussion on Hunter College's main campus regarding gender neutral restrooms because there are only three in the entire school. There only three what? Gender neutral restrooms. Two of them are single stall. Um, so there's currently a discussion of that going on um, that different people are pushing for. Um, I just wanted to ask how you would advise the approach of students interested in implementing change and current LGBT students or future leaders in the movement who are really invested in ensuring that, that there is substantial change going forward. I think the answer here is um, to get the evidence. And this has worked on a lot of cases. I'm, I'm, I'm Critical of the media often, but in this one particular, people are allowed to get away with predicting disaster when social changes happen, and then when there is no disaster, not being held accountable. I mean, where are all the articles that go to every politician who talked about how socially destabilizing same-sex marriage would be, and then asked, well, uh, did, did that happen? You know, show me where it has been. And we don't do enough of that. And similarly, there are now unisex bathrooms, non-sexual bathrooms, non-sex segregated bathrooms in much of the country. And there are no incidents. And I think that's the way to do it. Is, I mean, let's do a systematic, thanks to the internet now, which I will tell you is a phrase I don't often use. I think it is the largest purveyor of misinformation and nonsense in human history. <laughs> but the, um, the internet would allow you to search and put them, to, where has it happened? I mean, who is it that you think wants to go into a bathroom to look at somebody else's genitals rather than a urinate? I mean, where, where is this happening? Who's, who's pretended to be a transgender when she isn't or he isn't? And so I, I really do think that is the best way. It, it, it works with other things. And, and, and I would assume this could be a great project and you could do it through the internet. Where are the negative examples? And uh, I, I don't believe there is, are there any prosecutions? Are there any cases of sexual molestation, et cetera? Uh, that would be the way I would, uh, I, I would go after it. The other thing I ask, although I know it's a little bit demagogic, but I, part of it is people just feel, ooh, icky. You know, they don't like that. So I ask, okay, how many people grew up in a house with a men's room and a women's room? <laughs> In 2007, there was a bill on the floor of Congress which you um, were part of a group who edited to remove protections for transgender people as a trade-off for having the bill pass so that gay, lesbian, and bisexual people could get those protections. Um, looking back on it, hindsight being 2020, do you feel differently at all? And given the current political climate, do you think that if that bill came around today, if it could go differently? Oh, it would go differently, but I don't feel, uh, I think one of the reasons it would go differently is we, that we did what we did. In the first place, it wasn't a decision made in 2007. The first bills to end discrimination in employment based on sexual orientation, none of them included transgender because nobody was paying much attention to transgender until well into the 2000s. It just, the community itself wasn't coming forward with all the problems they had, and the, the, the legislation, and in fact, in, in, in the states that had accepted, had adopted, some states had eight or nine states, none of them, until the mid 2000s, none of them included transgender. It just, and this was the problem. Transgender issues were new, it takes a while. We did in 2005 or six, when we started, include people who were transgender, and as I said, uh, the hate crimes amendments that we passed did include people who were transgender because 
that was not as controversial. But what happened was uh, we found, first point, by then the Republican Party had solidified as an anti-LGBT faction. So we had almost no votes uh, from the Republicans. I did the counting along with the speaker. and We had eight Republicans out of uh, 200 who were ready to support people, rights for people who are transgender. And we had about, of the 230 Democrats, we had about 20 or 30 who wouldn't vote with us. So we just didn't have the votes, we tried. We, and here was the dilemma that we had. Um, if we brought it up with transgender inclusion, an amendment would unfortunately have been adopted. And they were, you know, our opponents were clever about this. They wouldn't have stricken all transgenders. They would have put restrictions, one of which was no teacher may transition during the year. And there would have been others so that the result, again, like the, the military thing, there would have been a majority of the House voting essentially on the basis that uh, uh, vulnerable people, children, others had to be protected from this group. On the other hand, I will tell you this, people say, how can you vote for a bill that protects some people and not others? Well, I did in a number, I did, it's called the Civil Rights Bill. I voted for legislation starting in 1972. Until then, in my career, I have voted to protect women in the Equal Rights Amendment, not men. I have voted to protect African Americans, people with disabilities before I had one, um, <laughs> the elderly before I was one. Um, uh, you know, I voted, um, so uh, in the, if you hold out for everything, I don't think anything, but there's an even more important reason. I wanted the experience of members voting, f oh, and I'll tell you this, the fact that in many states we did have protections for LGB people, but not transgender or other uh, non-conforming groups, um, that helped us get further. Because when you, when you pass one of those laws, you have two problems, like I said before. One is this argument it's gonna have negative social consequences. Oh, if you pass one of those laws, it'll become a, uh, a haven for malcontents. People will get fired because they will, they'll claim this and they'll claim that. The argument was that these will be over-enforced and be too intrusive. The sad fact is, many of you probably know this, anti-discrimination laws are very hard to enforce and they are under-enforced. What happens is you pass an anti-discrimination law and you catch the people who said fag and nigger and dyke before the law passed. And then the law passes and the lawyers say, don't say that. And find some other reason why you don't want them. And it's hard to prove it because that's the American system. So we did think that having in place laws that protected on sexual orientation would help us defeat the argument for adding transgender. Um, we would have taken that up again in 2009 and 10 and tried to deal with it. The problem was that the priorities then were, uh, uh, according to people in the community, not employment at all for anybody, but the uh, military and marriage. And we worked on, uh, on those. And then um, we didn't have a Democratic House until then. But the House is about to pass a very broad bill for uh, full legal equality uh, that's totally inclusive of any sexual minority. And I think one, at the last I heard, the guy, Dave Cicilline from Providence, who's himself uh, a gay and out and was the mayor of Providence, he, um, he's, a, he's been the main sponsor. He told me there's one Democrat who's not voting for it out of 230 something, and we'll probably get a handful of Republicans. But the problem was in 2007, we, it was, the reason it was taken out of the bill was it would have lost, not just lost, but it would have resulted in a, uh, an anti-trans statement being made. And so then the question is, are you better off with something or nothing? And I will tell you this, and this is, if the bill could have become law, what we do, it wasn't. Um, I think something's better than nothing if you can protect millions of people, not everybody. Now, I'll take the last argument, which is valid in theory, but I think not in, in, in practice. Well, the argument was if you pass the bill to cover LGB people, there won't be enough support left to go the further step. And I think our history is the opposite, that in fact people don't forget about the others 
and the experience of, of a partial victory helps move on. So earlier in your conversation, you mentioned the importance of uh, the caucus, the importance of uh, having um, other individuals in the movement um, support uh, key initiatives. So how is, how is now, um, in terms of um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, the, the movement, as we've seen in Stonewall, the movement that we've seen uh, increase in the decades, how is it important that uh, the community embrace other issues such as uh, gun, uh, gun control? Um, and where do you see the future of that? Well, I, I would differentiate. Um, I, I mean, people ought to be free to be for whatever they want to be for. I do think, though, you should, you should be careful to extend the principle which you are claiming for yourself to everybody else. That is, you know, gun control does not involve discrimination against maybe against living people, I suppose. But um, what, what we're saying is we should be free to be treated equally without regard to these personal characteristics. I do think, yes, that obligates you to be for racial freedom and, and for other kinds as well, because you, you can't claim, I think, a right that you denied other people. And I do think we, we benefit. It's also the case, by the way, that there's a a political logic to it because the fact is it's the same people who are supportive of uh, in, in both cases. But I don't think there has to be uh, uh, a party line on on other issues. If there are, I, I do think there's if there's a candidate running for office who's very pro uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and other sexual minorities, uh, but he or she is anti-black, I don't think that person should be supported. Uh, similarly on abortion, because that's very important to women. But if the person is for, um, not for gun control, I don't think that's a disqualifier for gay and lesbian organizations. I think it's a question of, you, you, you should not support someone who is gonna deny to any group the rights we claim for ourselves, but a difference over the tax rate doesn't disqualify someone. Now, I probably wouldn't want to vote for them on other grounds, but I, I, I don't think uh, that should be the GLBTQ issue. So um, during your time in Congress, were there, what were some moments when you felt um, the intersection between being gay and Jewish? Oh, I felt that early on. Um, I, uh, I realized I was gay around the time of my bar mitzvah in 1953, literally. And, um, I uh, later I had a very interesting conversation with a man, and um, now's a chance for you to start working with old people's mental issues because I'm having a lapse here. Um, Leonard Garment, older people remember, he was a New York City big law firm Jewish lawyer who was close to Richard Nixon and was one of the allegedly more civilized Nixonians. And Len Garment was a Jewish guy who was blonde and blue eyes. And um, he and I talked at some point after he'd left the Nixon administration about the similarity of being gay and being Jewish in America. Uh, in both cases, you have deniability for many people, not, not for everybody. And uh, you have this question, of how do you feel? Because you're listening to people be bigoted because they don't know you're one of the people they're being bigoted against. And I would hear any gay comments, and Garmin talked about hearing anti-Jewish comments in the 50s and 60s when he was uh, practicing law in, in New York. So I, I, just as I said in that previous answer, yeah, I, there were great similarities to being Jewish and being gay in terms of uh, being the victims of this kind of prejudice. And, and uh, I am proud to say that, yes, the CBC has been very good the next group in terms of support are the Jewish members. Jew Jews have generally been overwhelming, more supportive uh, of gay rights. And I think part of it is the experience of being discriminated against helps bring in some solidarity. Beyond that, I didn't, I'm not at all religious. Um, and uh, so it's, I know there are some people who see theological and philosophical affinities. Uh, I don't. I, 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 just don't pay much attention. I mean, I, 
I've read all the stuff, and I, uh, to be honest, I my own view is that um, both Jews and Catholics, from my standpoint, made a mistake by uh, translating the prayers into everyday language because I think they are much more impressive as uh, as unintelligible poetry <laughs> than as uh, actual language. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Um, I just had a quick question regarding, just further on identity. Um, how did being gay inform your career as a politician, and how did your career as a politician inform your identity as a gay man? Oh, very good. Um, first of all, it shaped it very much. I, it shaped my job choice. When I went to college, again, remember, I, I, uh, I'm in high school now, and I want to be in politics, but I know I can't because I'm gay. Um, I didn't think about coming out in the 1950s. I mean, coming out, very few people came out. People were out only because they had no choice. It was just something, obviously, about their characteristics and their behavior patterns. Um, so I thought, OK, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I got to college, and I thought about this, and it struck me, you know, the best way, if I'm a lawyer, I'm out in the world, and I'm not married, and um, people are going to figure it out, or, uh, and, and it's going to be very hard to kind of dabble in politics. The model I chose, when it was being gay, said, this is what I better do. I uh, was in college during John Kennedy's election, 1960. And he set the pattern of taking people from the academic community and giving them important positions. Uh, there had always been academic economists, but he had people doing non-technical jobs. And I thought, now that works well, because the university is a much more tolerant place than the world at large. You know, there were people who I knew in the faculty who we assumed were gay, and you know, but, but, but it was much less judgmental. And um, so I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be an academic. I'm going to go to graduate school, get a PhD, teach, and then every so often take a couple of years and go into politics and come back. That that would be the, the way to do it. Um, I would tell you that I, I ultimately had to decide at some point, um, well, that, that's what I was doing. I then got involved, by, I, I was asked by the man who got elected mayor of Boston in 1967 to go to work for him. His name was Kevin White. He, I didn't know much about him, but he ran against a vicious, terrible, explicit racist named Louise Day Hicks, so I helped him out and we hit it off and he persuaded me to come to work for him. I said, well, I can do this for a couple of years and I gotta go back and I gotta write this PhD thesis. So I worked for him for a few years and I went back to school to write the PhD thesis. And at that point I discovered, um, in the first place, this is now after Stonewall. So I thought, well, you know what? I, I, this is not gonna be as bad as I thought it was. I mean, that's where Stonewall was so important. Before, I, before Stonewall, it was just unthinkable that you would tell anybody that you were gay unless this was part of an effort to have relations. I mean, it just, Dwight Eisenhower was this benign father figure in 1954 promulgated an executive order that said we could not get a security clearance. And the argument was, by the way, not that we could be blackmailed, that was part of it, but that we were bad people. We were the rotten apples that would spoil the, the barrel. Um, in fact, I was so infected by this, so I don't take a little longer, but one of the things that struck me that made me want to get into politics were the hearings involving Joseph McCarthy's effort, the senator, the right-wing demagogic, career-destroying senator, to punish the army because they wouldn't give his aide Roy Cohn's boyfriend, David Chandler. Shine didn't think he was Cohn's boyfriend, but Cohn did. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, he was punishing the army for this. And at one point, the army hired this very good lawyer from Boston named Joseph Welch. They still have it, it was called a kinderscope. It's a um, point of order. It's a wonderful thing to watch. And um, at one point, Welch is in a duel with Roy Cohn, who was a very gay and denying it, and just one of the worst people. I mean, he didn't commit mass murder, but in people who did not commit a lot of murders, He's the worst one I can think of. <laughs> and um, he, um, Welsh is asking him, how he leaked something that he wasn't supposed to. And Welsh was getting it done. He said, well, Mr. Cohn, 
where did that come from? How did that appear? And Cohn said, I don't know. He said, oh, Mr. Cohn, well, are we supposed to believe that it was brought forward by a pixie? <laughs> so McCarthy at this point is trying to intervene to help his friend, and he figures he's got an opportunity. He said, oh, Mr. Welsh, a pixie. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. We need to have that term defined. W what is a pixie, Mr. Welsh? And Welsh, looking right at Roy Cohn, says, some of you will remember this, a pixie senator is a close relative of a fairy. <laughs> it was a devastating use of homophobia to hurt Cohn. And as a 14-year-old gay teenager, I cheered Welsh for saying it, even though I realized it was fully homophobic, because that's where we were. The point of, you know, this was, this was such an uphill battle, why bother trying to fight it? Um, but by 71, when I had retired from the city and gone back, you know, it may be possible not to win office, but to be gay and sort of survive, it, you know, it's not as bad. Um, and at that point, I was asked by a uh, friend of mine who was a member of Congress, I want to go down and be his chief of staff. And the point was, at that point, I had to decide, did I want to be a politician or an academic? And I thought, you know what, I can survive as a politician. Any gay prejudice has diminished. And I then chose to be a, uh, a politician again. So that, you know, being gay was no longer as much of a, a career mover. And I did it, by the way, in part because of a characteristic I have. Uh, one of the things I try to tell people who ask me for career advice, and I'm reluctant to give it, but you shouldn't pick a career because you think you're supposed to. I mean, uh, you can't live holding a gun to your own head. It's like that scene in Blazing Saddles. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the, y y if you really hate something, you're probably not going to be very good at it. And then I realized, as between being a politician and being a professor, there was a personal characteristic that I have and still have that clearly pointed me in the direction of being a politician. And I mean this quite seriously. I have a short attention span. <laughs> so when I'm in a legislative body, in the course of a day, I have to deal with seven or eight different issues and be interrupted if you're a professor, you better be able to concentrate and do research and write. So I said, okay, I'll be a politician. <laughs> so I then went and got elected to the state legislature, but I then figured it, it turns again, this is in the 70s, and I have this district that I think I can win because it's highly educated, it's not typical Boston, and, um, but I know I can't go any further. I can just be a state representative. I can't get elected to Congress. There was actually a possibility I could get elected to Congress it was a district liberal enough, but the incumbent was the one I lived in was one of the great men of America, Tip O'Neill, speaker. Well, you know, I, I would, uh, not, even if I could, it would be ridiculous and I wouldn't. And, and uh, uh, so I said, here's what I'll do. I'll stay on for another couple of years. And I, I got elected to the state legislature. I then went to law school. I, I went back to law school saying it's safe to go into the real world now because it's clear that it's not as homophobic as it used to be. And um, I uh, started coming out in the late 70s. Uh, I was coming out at that point retail. And I, I don't you know how people's experiences differ, but you would hear violins playing in your head and you would have a serious conversation with my siblings at three and my closest friends, my political allies, and I told them I was gay and some of them were surprised, many of them weren't. I was out by that time to all the other gay people that I was working with politically. And I was planning, okay, I'll, I'll run for one more term in the state legislature. I would pass the bar exam, and I will come out, and I will be, in the first place, a gay person with more political experience than most. I've had 10 years as a state representative. And I will make a lot of money as a lawyer, but also be an advocate for, uh, for uh, let me just say, um, uh, gratuitously, attacks on Bernie Sanders because he made money are really unfair and stupid. Um, I, he, he's entirely right to be indignant. Now, in my experience, he's indignant all the time. <laughs> but in this case, he, he is right to be indignant. But um, the, um, I decided, okay, I'm going to come out and, and, uh, and be you know, a leader in our gay rights movement. And then um, the Pope intervened. <laughs> the member of Congress in the district next to mine, which was also pretty liberal, I only lived a mile away from it, was a Jesuit priest named Robert Drynan, who had been the dean of Boston College Law School. And he'd served for 10 years. He'd gotten elected as an any-war candidate, 
When the new pope came in, he was very liberal, and, uh, but the Jesuits defended him. He was a Jesuit. And the new pope came in, John Paul II, was very conservative. And he uh, was lobbied by American conservatives. A right-wing congressman named Robert Dornan was one of the leaders. Uh, he is otherwise best known because his uncle, Jack Haley, anybody know why he was famous? He was the Tin Man, right, in The Wizard of Oz. Um, but uh, the Pope ordered Dryden not to run again. And uh, I had become a prominent, uh, interesting, freedom, another word for nothing left to lose. In the 70s, it was when liberalism was retreating, ultimately gave it to Reagan. Um, so a lot of liberals were pulling in their horns because they were going to want to run for other offices, and they figured if they were too liberal, they couldn't do it. I knew being gay, I couldn't win anything else. So I suddenly became the leading liberal by process of elimination. I mean, they just other people, you, you, you do that, we'll, we'll support you. And um, he was this liberal who was kneecapped by the Pope. And uh, a lot of liberals said, we, we, you run, let's show the Pope. No, yeah, he doesn't want a Jesuit, let's give him a gay Jew. <laughs> um, although, you know, the gay part that later uh, came out, uh, Dryden always said he wanted to ask the Pope, did that work out the way you would you <laughs> expect it? But um, the, um, I ran one and figured, okay, I can, uh, I can do this. But I made the decision that I would have to be closeted. I stopped coming out and you know, sort of, remember saying to my brother-in-law, my comments, he just heard the closet door slam because Dryden's not running and I'm gonna run. And I got to Washington and figured, okay, I'm gonna be publicly just closeted and not talk about my sexuality. Privately, I'll live as a gay man, but it didn't work. You can't be prominent and have that kind of a secretive social life, so I behaved stupidly, uh, pursued sex in the wrong way, and it's finally I said, you know what, this isn't working, and I'm gonna come out, I don't care what happens. I mean, I care, but I, I can't keep staying this way. Little side issue. Some of the most best known liberal members of Congress at the time, because people began to realize, it, it was known I was gay, they, heard I was thinking about coming out. And they, my liberal friends all said, please don't do this, because you will Including diminish. Yes, <laughs> you will diminish your uh, ability to, uh, to be effective. Well, including Pat Schroeder and Ron Dellums, and some wow. of the best people ever, because wow. they said, you're a great ally, and we don't want you to be pigeonholed. And I said, you know, that might happen. I can't deny it, but I can't live this way. This is nuts for me, personally. I mean, I, I, let me just say another aside. People say, oh, of somebody. He or she is so into work that, the, that the, she doesn't need a private life. <laughs> Crap. Everybody has personal, psychological, and physical needs that you cannot deny. And if you deny them, they get channeled. And you make that your work life. You become miserable, not just to yourself, but a, a lot of the crabbiest people we know of publicly, I understand that the reason is that, is, is that they were suppressing their sexuality so much. But... Um, so I, I did come out, and after I did, many of those same people said to me, we were wrong, you're better at the job now because you're not so angry anymore. And it's a very interpersonal job. We will continue the discussion upstairs with a glass of wine. Please give this great gay Jew and the panel a big round of applause.